We're Moongazer Farms. I'm Josh, and this is my wife, Sandra. We have a small family farm up in Mendocino County, not too far from here. And as Dan said, we're, uh, we've been practicing hugel culture for about four years now. And we, last year, we got a lot into our, how we build the hugel culture. And this year, we'll, be kind of, we'll do a little bit of that. But this year, we're also going to go into maintaining hugel culture and also the polycultures that we like to employ that works well in our region. Yeah, so we have a 10,000 square foot commercial cannabis farm in Mendo, and it is entirely hugel culture. So it's amazing to think about permaculture at a commercial scale, which we don't really think about a lot, you know? So, and that's, you know, in large part due to the plant, which we'll talk about as well. But um, in case there are people out here who don't know what hugel culture is, is there anybody who doesn't know what it is? Cool. Okay. So it means hill culture, and it's about building soil. So normally, you know, ganja farmers, you know, we see smart pots, and, you know, they buy some soil from somewhere, and that's how they grow. But this is about making your own soil from resources you have on your own land, ideally, or nearby. So just real briefly, kind of just laying out how we, we did this. Um, it's good to do it on contour, which Dan Marr actually helped us figure out. And um, finding the contours of your land is easy if you build an A-frame. Dan, did you bring your A-frame? Didn't bring the A-frame. But yeah, you can look it up. Um, we were going to bring ours, but we didn't. But if you look up building an A-frame, it's really a cool way. And if you build your hugel beds on contour, um, it allows for, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so this photo here is the top of our garden. Our, our garden is at a slight angle. As you can see, we're relatively flat. And at the top of our garden, this is holding tons of water. And throughout the g growing season, um, you'll you'll see that a lot of the area below this this garden is also stays green even though we're not watering it. So that is due to a lot of the water re being retained and going underground. And it gets very hot where we're at. It's not that we don't need to water at all. We are still watering, but just the water retention aspect is is critical. And even times like now when it rains, you will get a lot of uh, water will stay in those rows. Um, and it creates a beautiful habitat for frogs and all different kinds of life, which is part of what we're after here. So polyculture, hugel culture, there's a lot of culture going on here, and it's, a lot of it's in the soil, we've got lots of worms, and we're trying to encourage, or we are encouraging as much life, as much uh, different forms of life as possible, and we'll dive in more into that too with the different plants that we grow. And why hugel culture works so well for us is we're in the oak woodlands, and we've also had fires like super close to our farm every year now for the past three years. Like it's so basically either we manage our woods or the fire will or both, whatever you know. So we need to clean up the understory. We need to thin. Um, we need to take care of brush every year. And what are we going to do with that? Most people burn may have burn piles, which, you know, it's smoky all summer. It's got to be smoky all winter, too. Like, sucks. So instead, we clear all that wood as much as we can. Every year, we're building more and more hoogles. But we start by clearing the woods and, and basically burying wood. And so we start with, you know, rotting wood, ideally. If it's rotting, it's better, but it doesn't have to be. Large pieces of wood, small pieces of wood, basically anything. Then there's some native soil, compost or manure, hay, wood chips, oak leaves, etc., etc., etc. It goes on forever. And I always say there's no rules. You know, Josh and I, we're building a hugel and we have different ideas of how we want to do it. So um, it's kind of whatever you have and trusting your instincts and thinking, you know, hey, we have a lot of oak leaves. 
maybe we can do something with these, you know, like just trusting yourself. Well, not just maybe, but oak leaves pound for pound are even more nutritious than, than manure. So. so we'll continue on here and get into our cultures a little bit. Is it the green button? Oh, yeah. Okay, here's a little bit more about the basics. Yeah, so this is our most recent hugel that we had our crew help us build um, just like two weeks ago. And it's so fun. It's like totally art and creation as well. Um, so check out our website, moongazerfarms.com, for more info on starting a hugel culture bed from the, from the start. But um, yeah, isn't it beautiful? Looks beautiful, right? Ooh. Ooh. So again, in all this, none of this would really be possible. We couldn't really be small scale farmers, commercial cannabis farmers doing this without the plant and all the wisdom that this plant has and that it's allowing for small farmers to have a place so just, again, we're co-creating with this plant for sure. And we love this plant. And I, I'm a ganja farmer, you know, and I'm, a, I'm a MF ganja farmer. You know, that's like, you know, it's not, I'm not, grow, I'm growing tomatoes too and all that, but like, I do it for this plant. Yeah, and this plant growing it at this scale, um, in this style, I mean, it's only possible because of, of prohibition and everything that this plant has been through. So we really give thanks to the plant to be able to even grow this way and a big thanks to all the people who support us to be able to grow this way. It's, it's our passion and, and uh, we're so sh happy to be able to share it on a daily basis. And it's, and it's hard work, we all know it. Labor of love. Okay, so the reason that we came up with the word practical for how we're doing this is because, uh, you know, I mean, you can go and you can use any kinds of plants that you, that you like, really. I mean, uh, potatoes or Jerusalem artichokes, any kind of roots might do the trick of attracting gophers, so they're not going after your roots, for example. Jerusalem artichokes are those real big uh, plants with the yellow flowers, and we chop them and drop them, and um, also why it's practical is that a lot of times... Uh, we're trying to stack functions with the plants that we grow. So what, uh, besides food, uh, what other functions can this, can this provide us? It's a gopher uh, attractant, uh, or, or deterrent, I guess you could say. Um, or both. Or both. <laughs> um, they, you know, they have amazing biomass. You can make amazing ferments with it. I was talking with a, a guy the other day that, that this Jerusalem artichoke ferment is fantastic for... I believe aphids, uh, of dealing with aphids. And um, I mean, and just polyculture in general is super effective. You can see that little, there's a little dot up in that oak tree. Uh, it just, we, we are even attracting uh, bald faced hornets to our garden, and they've done amazing work. We didn't have any caterpillars this year, we didn't, and we didn't do any spraying. I mean, we, we just do it all with the polycultures, does all the work for us. And it's really a thing of beauty. Yeah, so polyculture, of course, plants, and of course, you know, food crops and, you know, flowers, but also polyculture, we're attracting animals, we're attracting insects, like, it's no surprise that the hornets chose to make a house right on the edge of the garden, right? Like, so we're inviting, you know, every, everybody's invited to the table. And when we talk about kind of practical polyculture, you know, so we're talking about things that are easy and things that like stack functions too. So the Jerusalem artichoke, for instance, when we, when we chop it down, that's great biomass that turns into food for next year's cannabis plants or for whatever else we're going to plant. It also is food for us, you know, not my, it's, it's Josh loves Jerusalem artichoke. I, is that, it's good um, to eat, you know, um, and, and like we said, the gophers, whatever, we know that's a problem. They, they'll hopefully go for that more than the cannabis. We've never used cages. We don't have a problem. So 
I think it's because we're giving all the creatures, you know, they, they, are, they live there too, so we're saying, go for this. Um, and then on top of that, things that reseed themselves, we're really into, you know, and we'll get to that as well, but stacking functions, easy. Reseeding itself, the Drusum archelk, they're gonna come up next year. I don't have to plant them, I don't have to pick them. I, we can s spread it, but like making our lives easier. Yeah, I mean, regenerative means a lot of things um, right now, and to us, do these crops regenerate? Um, cover cropping is a really popular topic in organic, obviously. I mean, it's an important step in organic cultivation for sure, but oftentimes we have to question where do these seeds come from that we're buying bags of? I mean, obviously they're coming from a monocropped fava bean farm or a monocropped uh, oat farm or something like that. Um, so can we grow them ourselves? And, and the answer is yes. I mean, the, the Jerusalem artichokes, like Sandra said, they'll come back. The potatoes, when we harvest potatoes, we leave a little bit and they, they overwinter. They'll come back the next year. Um, fava beans are a really amazing crop for us, an amazing function stacker. Um, we'll chop a little bit of them and drop them, but oftentimes we let them reseed. Um, we'll eat the, we'll, we eat them as food. Um, and when you, in the summertime, when they're dry, we, we let them reseed. We kind of have to smack them around and let the, the seeds fall. And since they're big seeds, they come up through our mulch relatively easily. So they're one of our favorites. Yeah, and like two years ago, we like picked all the fava bean seed and we shucked it and we put it somewhere and maybe we sowed it. I don't know. But this year, we like had no time. We just kept a bunch standing. They dried out in the summer. And then we just going around the garden, just any time, you know, they're dry, we're just putting them around. We haven't had to sow any seed. It's popping up now. It's like, that let's make our, simplify our lives. It's, we're, you know, in season with it. So, yeah, just, and we're learning all the time how to make our lives easier. So, yeah, fava beans. And then another thing we just want to talk about is perennials and annuals. And hugel culture is just amazing at, you know, in the same bed, you have your perennials and you have your annuals, and they just kind of work together, and, and it's, it's unconventional, you know, and it's, and it's amazing. Yeah, this, this is definitely a perennial style um, of farming, and the cannabis has a place in there, and we definitely want to emphasize that. And um, you know this is completely no-till. I don't know if we mentioned that yet, but it's a it's a way spiritually we think of it as giving back always to to the earth. We're always adding material, whether it's uh, you know just chopping and dropping our own stuff, or we'll go. Uh, we got a hay farm not too far away from us that we'll buy a little bit of organic grass hay that that we that we know of and, and like to support. So this is a photo from the spring. Uh, this is a lot of the, the things that have regenerated and like you got potatoes and some dead nettles it looks like, fava beans um, just going crazy and comfrey is a huge one for us which we love to just chop and drop a, th a few times throughout the season and we never know where in the beds we're going to plant our cannabis. It always kind of depends, you know, different clumps of fava beans will pop up at, at a certain time. And, and this, the bed sort of dictates where we're going to be planting our, our cannabis. But generally, we're planting them about five to seven feet from each other um, in a given bed, which are, they're about, our beds are about five or six feet wide, and, and they'll range from about 50 feet long to 100 feet long. Yeah, so you see, we're just, it's just all, everybody's invited to the party. So this is pretty beautiful pick of our cucumbers with the Jerusalem artichoke, with the herb, with the beans. Crushing. So for us, we're up in Mendo. Food crops that have done great with cannabis, um, garlic, potatoes, kale, artichoke, Jerusalem artichoke, fava beans, arugula, winter squash, watermelon and lettuce. Those are ones that seem like we have had a lot of success with. 
And the ones that are starred, you know, another thing we are always considering is, again, we're trying to simplify our lives and things that create, like, that seed, that don't cross-pollinate. Well, that, the seed, I want to talk about the seed. You know, things that, like, you know, watermelons. Oh, well, yeah, watermelon's its own example that, uh, although we always strive for diversity of water, you know, our area is so small, we can really only grow one variety of watermelon, and, and, uh, and then that's the seed that we'll be, we'll be harvesting every year. The crimson sweet is one that we really like. Okay, well, like what I'm trying to say is, for instance, Swiss chard and beets. I personally prefer beets to eat, but if I grow Swiss chard out to seed and I grow beets out to seed, they'll cross, and maybe they'll make a great cross too. That's perfect Swiss chardy beet. Nick says no. Nick says no. So I would, but you know, so I would like to let the beets go to seed, and I'll and I'll chop down the seed of the Swiss chard, whatever. Some not, you can be different every year, but um, you know, just being thoughtful, because then if the beets go to seed, and then the seed scatters. I don't have to even sow the seed. It sows itself. So I'm just always trying to not, I don't even want to sow the seed. I want it to sow itself. Um, and you know, that's what we found with the potatoes, although we're always planting more potatoes and we're learning about stuff. But the kale, we've just let the kale go to seed and it pops up wherever it wants to. And, um, and you know, we'll plug the transplants in too, but it's just fun to not, you know, not even have to, you know, transplant. Sometimes we do. Sometimes uh, you'll have a bunch of kale's seedlings will all sprout in one place together, and and you you may at the right time you can go through and, and prick them out and, and move them around. Uh, arugula is a great one too. Arugula is fantastic because they don't cross with other brassicas. We can't say say enough about that. And and our kale. I think our dino kale might have crossed with our red Russian, and we have a little cross of that happening right now, a little moon gazer uh, Russian variety that we like. And they're just going crazy right now. I don't have a photo of it, but at this time of year, I mean, we're kind of kale farming right now at our place, which is fantastic. And we all, we all love big, big ganja plants, right? Like, it's just like, mm. And we got, like, big kale plants. <laughs> You know, like, so it's just, like, that, you know, they, they're amazing. So we like that, too. Um, but I wanted to, so then we have garlic here. We, Josh does go through, and so, you know, we, he's been really into garlic lately. But um, you want to talk a little bit about garlic? Well, just, just another re uh, fantastic regenerating crop that if we store them, you know, if we store them properly, and, and each year we just increase our seed stock, and... Uh, that's going to be a big uh, diversified crop for us in, in, in the coming years um, as we increase our stock. And the sulfur aspect, I mean, g um, getting into biodynamics and, and that kind of stuff, the garlic's another, is a the function stacker in that sense. I mean, they bring sulfur into the soil, and sulfur, as we know, is, along with nitrogen, is an amazing um, amino acid and, and protein builder. And... And uh, you know, and on the flip side, even organic uh, vineyards will spray sulfur in the spring to uh, minimize, like you know, mold and mildew in the fall and stuff like that. And and here's another example of bringing it into our garden naturally and and not having to import things. That's again, regenerative means a lot of things, but to us, closing the loop is huge. So if we can close the loop in as many aspects as we can, that's that's big for us. Right, so if we're bringing sulfur into the garden by planting garlic and the you know, organic vineyard down the street is bringing sulfur in in some sort of powder, like, okay, but where did that sulfur come from? Like, where did that have to get mined from? You know, and, and we're talking about cover crops and it's awesome to go to the store and buy cover crops, but then that's like another thing coming from off the farm. So if you can close the loop somehow where it's coming from the farm back into the farm, that's just going to make, you know, the difference in our pocketbook and, and just like we're talking about, just keeping it, just trying to close loops, which is what Josh says, you know, every day, all day. And it just makes sense practically for us. We're just, uh, I mean, we're, we're cutting costs. We're, 
we're, you know, we're farming our own ladybugs. Um, it's, it's really about low cost and, and highest quality. Uh, and, and I can't stress enough how important that is, especially from a commercial standpoint. The prices are fluctuating. We don't know what kind of moves the corporate corporate guys are taking and stuff like that. And we got to just just kind of hunker down and, and grow as high quality as we can with as little input as we can. And it just so happens to be it's the best quality, too. <laughs> And so here we, you know, so many of us love. Oh, cool, five minutes. So yeah, so we, you know, many of us love fava beans, but just here is just a visual. Okay, so not only does the fava bean fix nitrogen into the soil, which you know feeds our ganja plants and other plants, but okay, so the aphids are eating the fava bean, and then the, and then the ants are involved in that too, and now we got the ladybug who's eating the aphids, and we got the yellow jacket that's eating the mites that are there, and then I'm eating the, the beans, and it's just like, you, you, here we go, now we're talking, like, this is a, this is a polyculture, you know, this is, it's working. Um, and this slide is kind of just showing like the hugel maintenance you know, we're chipping all the time. I wish, you know, yeah, we, the, we're just chipping all the time. Um, so layer of wood chips, uh, layer of alfalfa, um, you know, fava beans popping up. This picture was taken like two weeks ago. Um, yeah. And, you know, th this is, again, another unconventional uh, aspect of this farming style is that the, the whole NPK or fertility aspect, we're kind of coming at it in a different way instead of, like, we haven't taken any soil sa um, samples or, or analysis. I mean, this is just a, a matter of, again, l um, laying down material, giving back to the soil, giving back to the life in the soil, and the fertility comes. And... And oftentimes, fertility is, is sort of uh, mixed with, or mistaken for like, f like fry, free, free ability, like, uh, por like the porosity of the soil. And when you have life in there, you don't, you don't need to till. I mean, it's, the worms are tilling for us. The, the gophers are, are actually doing good work down in there. And we don't need to disturb that. Uh, it's, it stays super loamy. Um, I have a video recently of our Instagram of planting garlic. Uh, I was just kind of poking holes with my finger and just planting the garlics in through the soil. I mean, it's, uh, it stays really nice and, and light and, and wonderful. And uh, the, the idea that like, oh, wood chips are gonna steal away from your nitrogen, it's, it may be a little bit true to an extent, but it only takes a little bit of of your chopped comfrey and a little bit of our goat manure to really just sort of balance that out and, and create a really nice habitable soil for all life. So of course, thank you to the Emerald Cup. Thank you everybody here, you know. <laughs> like doing a lot for all of us. Regenerative cannabis farming, um, biovortex, Dan Mar, Rika, you know, everybody here, just, we're doing it together, aren't we? Everybody. Yeah. You know, we, and if you're, if you're interested in tasting some of our, you know, some of our herbs, Soulful and Sebastopol has been such, a, such an amazing, um, you know, supporter of, of all these regenerative farmers and um, chemistry, they do, um, you know, they have uh, vape pens and tinctures. They have a booth here. We're working with them. Madrone, this was up. Um, check us out on Instagram. Josh, Josh holds down the Instagram. We all know that's hard work. That's some hard work. So thank you, Josh. Um, Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award. That was such an honor to win that. And um, to us, that's just like, you know, we're just stoked on it and hope that, you know, we see you guys on that stage too, accepting that award. And um, Dragonfly Earth Medicine Pure, gotta go check out the TP if you haven't already, go get some cocoa, talk to those people, learn about that. Um, yeah, just, 
check us out. Oh yeah, what about our twin boys? We're doing all this with twins. We got, we got twins, yo, seven month old. Where are they? Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.